Hello, I'm Chris Packham, a naturalist, broadcaster, environmental campaigner, and now I've been promoted to the job of the chief ecologist for EcoTalk, the mobile phone service provider that when you subscribe to, you directly help the restoration of nature. And this is where some of that restoration is going to be done. This is Bowyer's Wood in Sussex, 300 acres. And I know what you're thinking, you're looking at it, you're thinking, wow, that doesn't need restoring. It looks absolutely beautiful. It's lush, it's green. And I've got to tell you, it is pretty special. It's got woodland, it's got streams, it's got ponds, it's got this pasture land, but it could be working so much harder for nature and we know how to fix it. So I've met up with the team who are going to be doing just that. Our team, Christine, Steve, Chris and James, collectively have over 150 years of experience in land management, forestry and rewilding. Should we have a look in here? Yeah, this is something we want to show you here. Yeah. What we've got here then is an old coppice stall, chestnut. This is coming to the time where it needs to be coppiced again though, isn't it? Yep. This is approaching the point where we would call it moving towards being overstood, which means that it's becoming too big, but also it's taking up a lot of the canopy, so less light is getting into the coppice. Steve, in the past, what would have this been used for? Sussex and Kent, the chestnut was predominantly planted originally for the hop industry, so that would have been poles, etc. But it makes a great fencing product because it doesn't rot at the same rate that other timber does, because there's a lot of tannins in the timber. So farmers still want this for deer fencing, stock fencing, it's good for that. When this is coppice, it's going to be cut off down close to the ground here. The whole lot comes down and it's taken away. A lot of people see that as a really brutal practice. It's quite disturbing at that point. I can still get that shock myself. I cut some timber the last couple of years of a place which I'm very fond of and I was re reluctant to cut it at first. What people forget is that this is part of a cycle. So we've let a lot of light into that wood and I'm now watching different flowers come up, different plants, and also different bird use. And I would imagine that as the summer goes on, we'll see a new movement of butterflies in there. Yesterday I was walking past it in the evening, I could see the bats moving through it. So I think this is what people can often get shocked when they see a standard coppice cut. They can be like, oh, this is you know, very destructive, this is the end. But actually if they concentrate on what comes next, deepen their appreciation of nature and what is you know you obviously get the coppice coming back new shoots but you get this variety of use from other creatures okay so if we take all of this down let's fantasize for a moment that we can completely clear and coppice this um, that's going to add an enormous richness to the environment here in terms of the variety of life isn't it mm -hmm. yes it will it's learning from the past about how we can take it forward to the future it's maintaining a coppice cycle which if you don't coppice it, it falls apart and it becomes much more difficult um, to do it from a financial point of view. And I'm just looking through, I mean we've got some fern, there's a bit of thin bramble, there's even one or two bluebells over there, but that's not maximising the capacity of this woodland to, to do good for nature. Not at all, and again it's the lack of light, I mean it, it changes, it's, it, it's creating diversity in, across time, it's creating structural diversity and then because we've been doing this all across the woodland. On, on day two, the day after this has been coppiced, it's going to look a little bit like a woodland bombsite and that's hard for some people to take, so winning over hearts and minds is part of the process isn't it? Absolutely and I from my experience with if, with working with 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 coppice workers and woodland owners is that if you do it in a measured manner and if it's happening around you people get it Pe people always get it it's people don't like change. What about the product because in the past this would have had commercial value um, even if it's not sold, it could be used here, couldn't it? I mean, this would make a lovely post for a deer fence, surely. I think it's really important to maintain that, that value in what it was, because, again, it gives you the connection with the past. And also, we actually do need this stuff. Yeah. We can't go and get it from B&Q or wherever else. We, it, it, I mean, it's here, and it's here, and there's, there's tonnes of it here to yeah. be used.
One of the things I like doing when we're in wood like this is using the biology to read the archaeology. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yes. Because we've got this old bank here, haven't we? Which would have been a boundary as a hedge boundary, maybe? Or yes, what do you think? It, well, it, it would have been woodland uphill and some kind of pasture downhill and the bank was cast up and then a hedge plant on, on top of it to allow the woodland to regenerate after its most recent cutting, yeah. thinning, whatever. Yeah. So the woodland was more valuable, the bank goes that way, the ditch is on this side, and then things like the beach here are the remnants of the hedge that was planted to keep livestock out of the woodland. Look at that. That's a magnificent tree, isn't and it? And you can see the last time it was cut. So don't camp underneath it. Because it might... Because beach is really good at shattering Yeah. when it gets dry. But it's it tempting gets... to camp under, because look, when you tempting. gaze up, look at that now. I mean, that is a cathedral of green light, isn't it? The richness is amazing. Yeah. Let's head through to this glade. Glades are incredibly important in the grand scheme mm. of things, aren't they? Definitely want some open space in a woodland. Well, this is a very different structure. What do we think's been going on here? I would say it was an open area within the woodland. If you look at the map, you can see that it, it, it didn't have trees on it. The oak trees over there, they're all the same age and have fairly obviously naturally regenerated. And speaking to local people, there were um, sheep, sheep were being grazed on here about 50 years ago. 50 years, that's not long. And it's amazing how quickly woodland will take over, given the opportunity. Yeah. And, and probably then the deer pressure was much less than it is now, and so it happened easily. OK, so what are our options here? I'm thinking one thing might be wood pasture. We could clear out some of these trees, allow a lot more light in, and then the ground floor, in a more open sense, could, could prosper. I think it's a very good idea. I think it's what we want to do. And I, I would like to actually maybe take that a step further. It's something I don't know a huge amount, but I think wood meadow, I think, even is, is, is even more of a valuable habitat. So we're going to have to work that well with A, with the Forest Commission, but B, the, the people who know and love the area, because it's, it's, it's always a dramatic thing to fell trees. Um, baseline surveys, they're incredibly important. We need to know what we've got here now so we can know how well we're improving in the future. Yes, every single main contributor to the woodland environment is worthy of a survey and then a resurvey later on when you've made your interventions. Yeah, and there are some species we call indicator species, yes. which we can focus on because they really tell us more than the sum of their parts. It's not just about them, it's about ev everything yeah. else, isn't it? Yes, that's true. That's very definitely true for the plant cover, the indicator species there. And then if you're looking at woodland birds, I always think birds are great proxy for biodiversity. Having good work here to increase biodiversity then allows other connected woodlands, hedgerow systems to acquire species by migration, things like dormice and so on moving through the hedgerow network. And that would link very well with the habitat conservation on Ashdown Forest or on the Sheffield Park estate nearby. Being a nosy neighbour, that's what we need to be, looking over the fence to see what's living there that might come to us if we make it right. Things can migrate between the two and also the neighbours can be inspired to join in. Running through the woods is a network of streams feeding ponds and hidden pools. Looking down here, you're probably thinking, what lives in that pond? Is it worth anything at all? Well, yeah, there's a few mosquitoes in there. Things eat mosquitoes. You may not like them, but things eat mosquitoes. There's probably rat-tailed maggots and all sorts of other detritivores, animals that are eating that rotting vegetation. But that's about it. We could do so much better if we get in here with some brave pond and woodland management. Chris Perkins is the land manager and oversees the day-to-day -day running of all our rewilding projects. What do you think then, Chris? I mean, what we've got here is potential. At the moment, it's a stagnant pond, but it needs some work, doesn't it? It certainly does. Um, we're not quite sure what to do with it, which is the best approach. It's because of a very steep site. But at the moment, it's a home to mosquitoes and, and various other small invertebrates, isn't it? There's not a lot of richness in there and, and life and certainly not a lot of plant life providing any oxygen in that water. So 
my thought is that we need to take out some of these trees around the side. For a start in the summer, they're going to be drawing lots of water out through transpiration to fuel their energy gathering processes. Then they're going to be dumping all of those leaves into the pond, which are going to add more organic material. So I think taking some of those trees out is going to make a big difference. The other thing is in summer, of course, they'll be drawing a lot of water out of this pond to feed their leaves, as it were. So that would help. And then maybe going up that bank, if that were thinned, to mm -hmm. let the light come in through there. Obviously, save feature trees like this. This is a beautiful beach. We're not going to do anything with that. But I think that would transform it. And then it's a question, of course, of making sure that it prospers by getting some plant growth in there, some oxygen. Mm -hmm. So we could feed it some plants which are going to get that going. Maybe a few years while the plants get established and then it becomes a much more diverse pond. Yeah. So is there a sort of time scale of three or four years? I think so at least. I mean, the likelihood is you take these trees out and then something like duckweed will come in here and blanket this pond. Uh -huh. And it's gonna look like a disaster, but you've got to bite your lip and just stay with it for a few years until it gets itself going. But what we really want is more stuff living in that water, isn't it? Well, Chris, this is another key part of the project here, this open ground. But I've got to be very honest with you. At the moment, it's not looking good because this has been grazed to be within an inch of its life relatively recently. It hasn't got a great floral mix in here. There's no leaf litter for small mammals to hide in. So no kestrels and barn owls are going to be hot, you know, happy hunting here, are they? No, well, we have plans for that. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is the McDonald burger of grass. Um, we have plans for a four-star restaurant with nice uh, wildflower mix and grassland mix. Excellent. Because it's it's actually something that you just don't find in Sussex, is that you know wild grassland or semi-natural grassland. So that can be a relatively quick fix. In some places, they deep plough, so they turn over all of this grass, so there's no competition with the grass, and then you stick in the seed mix, and if you're lucky and it rains at the right time and doesn't rain at the right time, then within a couple of years, you could have a lovely flower meadow here. This is another matter. Let's take a look at the side of this woodland here, because that's not making me very happy, nor you, I imagine. No, not at all. It could almost have been drawn with a ruler, just the straight line. And that's not a natural sort of form that you find in nature. So we had exactly the same issue. Uh, and what we did was we actually took the fence down because we weren't going to do any more grazing in that area. And then rather brutally, we just went in there and we cut those trees down and let them fall whole out into the field and then just left them. Mm -hmm. And some of the other trees, we got the chainsaws and we cut a, a loop in the bark all around them to kill the trees so that we had some standing dead timber just like that there. And what this has done, as you know, is completely soften up the edge. Yes, it's important for birds um, actually flying in, feeling secure, but also it breaks up that geometry of the countryside, which you know, many people like, but it's not natural. It's not natural. Um, and what the mission is really is to bring the woodland out into the meadow and take some of the meadow into the woodland, right. you know, by having that sort of soft edge. And, and the dead timber, well, I mean, one third of everything that lives on a tree lives on it after it's dead. So dead wood is, is very, very valuable. Yeah, traditional farming and forestry is all about being very tidy. But even when you look at nature, you look at that tree up there, where that branch has come off mm -hmm. just because that's part of that tree's life process and there's a whole other ecosystem that starts developing around the fallen branch and if a hole occurs in the trunk you know nesting and whatever one of the key things is that if you allow a tree like that to drop out into the field and leave the crown intact it gives a chance for lots of things to grow up in through that crown which are protecting it from herbivores things like deer or you know, any other grazers, and you get like a clump of bramble, and then you get further trees germinating through it, and that's how you start to really bring that woodland out. I mean, this is just a bunch of nettles, but here we get some idea of the sort of soft edge yeah, right. of the wood that we're trying to achieve, isn't it? It's what we call the tapered edge, or the integrated edge. And one other thing we ought to say, because it's become unpopular in some conservation circles, is that we like scrub. Scrub is good. Scrub being sort of overground, bushy land. 
Great for warblers, great for butterflies, great for small mammals. What's wrong with scrub? Stand up for scrub, I say. Well, I, mean, I, I see a sort of three-layer system here. We have you know, shrubs, scrub, and then the high forest woodland yeah. behind it, but not the straight edge. And what we know is that the richest of all our ecosystems are those what we call the ecoclines, where you go from one dominant ecosystem into another. On that edge is where you find the greatest variety of life. So I think in terms of increasing our potential here, away from anything watery, then this is going to be one of the key sites, isn't it? Yes, I think so. This is going to be where we can make the most impact, I think. This is going to be very exciting because we're going to bring something back here that's been missing for a very long time. We are indeed. And this is actually the start of the area that we're going to put a fence and that fence will be built to very high specification to enclose beavers. 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 Ecosystem mm. engineers, they're going to come back in here and completely reshape this landscape, aren't they? Yes. And um, we've chosen this particular bit of landscape because the topography is kind of favourable as well as the food source for them. And food so, source, of course, is going to be the bark and, and the trees that are lining um, this, this little brook. Um, there's plenty of that available, I take it. There's plenty of that and there's also plenty of shrubs and little pools and all sorts of greenery. And we know that once we get a beaver in here, a pair of beavers, breeding beavers, mm. beaver downs, beaver lodges, yes. um, they're going to greatly enhance the variety of life. Fish, insects, amphibians, reptiles, birds, everything benefits from beavers, doesn't it? Yes, because at the moment this is, it's essentially a drain. Right. It's just taking water from the north of the wood straight from here. So they're going to make this woodland wetter, that's one thing. Yes. And that would be great for maybe marsh tit or something like that. When's it going to happen then? What's the plan? We need a license, don't we? We need a license. Um, the most of the way to getting a license, we're talking to Natural England at the moment. And of course, in the longer term, what we're all hoping is that we'll reach a certain point where we'll be able to throw open the fences and those animals will be able to move up and downstream here or they're young, mm -hmm. colonising other parts of these river catchments yes. and doing what they needed to do for hundreds of years. Some big days ahead. The release, it will be exciting actually putting the animals on the ground yeah. is amazing but then you know the dam the lodge that's always good but then when i've looked at other people that have been you know doing these sorts of projects it's when they see their first kits because then they've really put their mark on the environment mm. yeah oh, i can't wait can you imagine <laughs>